Faith Hedgepeth was born in Warren County in North Carolina in 1992. She was the fourth child to be born to the Hedgepeth family, with two older brothers and an older sister. She was a member of the Haliwa Saponi Native American tribe, and her mother, Connie Hedgepeth, described her as someone whose smile could light up the room the moment she walked in. But Faith's birth marked the end of an era for her family. Her parents had been having difficulties in their marriage and would separate within the year of Faith's coming into their lives. Something that perhaps was foreshadowed when her mother gave her daughter the name of Faith because, quote, that was what she was going to need to raise a fourth child when she already had two sons and a daughter and a husband with a drug problem. We can't say if Faith herself saw her name as a sign of her parents' impending divorce, but we do know that Faith was an eternal optimist with a drive to succeed in life. In high school, Faith was an honour student, a cheerleader and a member of a large number of extracurricular clubs and activities. She was a top student and worked hard in everything she did because she had the dream of being the first person in her family to graduate from university. Faith knew the road ahead of her would be tough, being the youngest of four siblings in a single mother household, but Faith had a plan. She did so well academically that she managed to qualify for the Gates Millennium Scholarship and she decided to go to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill to get her degree. Perhaps this was her taking after her father, who'd also attended that same university, but had dropped out before he could finish, but Faith had no intentions of doing the same thing. She actually had the plan to further her studies to become either a teacher or a paediatrician after she'd finished her undergraduate and she got to work setting her life up to do just that. She moved to Chapel Hill and did really well in her studies for the first two years of university, but she would take the spring semester off in 2012. She stayed in the area though, moving into a student apartment over the summer, where she planned to stay until her financial aid came through for her autumn semester and she could move to a different location. Even if it was just for the summer, Faith didn't just move in with anyone. She moved in with a friend that she'd been close with since their freshman year, Karina Rosario, who often went by the name Rosie to friends and family. In the student apartment with them was Rosie's boyfriend, Eric Tuke Jones, and on paper everything about the living situation between the three of them seemed just fine, but Eric had a mean streak to him. His relationship with Rosie was marred with a long history of domestic violence, and she would eventually break up with him and ask him to leave the apartment. Faith was a huge supporter of this move and continued to back Rosie and encourage her to keep her distance from Eric when he would repeatedly try to get back together or even just get back in touch with Rosie. Twice in July of 2012, Eric would try to break into the apartment, even after Rosie had changed the locks, and he would only leave them alone when Faith convinced Rosie to go to the police and have a restraining order filed against him. This forced Eric to keep away from the apartment, but only added fuel to the fire in the steadily deteriorating relationship between Faith and Eric. Eric didn't like the sway that she had over Rosie and blamed Faith for the problems the couple were having, but both Rosie and Faith stayed secure in their beliefs that the relationship between Rosie and Eric was toxic and dangerous, and Rosie kept away from him. 
and they were still separated on the evening of September 6th of 2012, when Faith made her way over to an event held by the Alpha Pi Omega sorority, a historically Native American-run sorority that Faith was really hoping to join. She left a few hours later, telling friends at the event that she needed to work on a paper that she was writing on the history of her tribe, and she met Rosie at the campus library. Between 8.30 and 9pm in the evening, Faith was still at the library and exchanged texts with her father, talking about how much she'd wanted to join the sorority, and then she got back to work, not leaving the library until after 11pm, when she and Rosie went back to their apartment. A little while later, Faith and Rosie decided to go to a local nightclub that would let under-21s in to dance, and they got there at around 20 to 1 in the morning. In a call that was timestamped as 1.23am, a friend of Faith would receive a call from her. The call went to voicemail and was a jumble of sounds as it seemed that Faith had accidentally pocket dialed whilst in the club. Years later, an expert would take a look at this recording and manage to piece together Faith crying for help, followed by a female voice saying, quote, I think she's dying, and a male voice answering, quote, Do it anyway. During this exchange, the two voices address each other as Eric and Rosie, and this would have been an incredibly damning part of Faith's story if it hadn't been for security footage showing Faith and Rosie leaving the club together at 2.06am. Rosie later told investigators that she had been suffering from a bad stomach and the girls had gone back to the apartment. Their downstairs neighbour, who was awake and watching TV at the time, remembers hearing three loud thuds at around 3am, which she believed could have been from a heavy bag being dropped or possibly furniture being turned over. Investigators were able to figure out that Faith's Facebook page was accessed around this time, believing it to be a sign that all was still well. They also found texts from Faith's phone to one of Rosie's ex-boyfriends, Brandon Edwards, at 3.40. The text read, quote, Rosie needs you more than you know. Please let her know that you care. They also found records of Rosie trying to call Brandon around this time from her own cell phone, but when he didn't answer, she reached out to Jordan McCrary, a football player she'd met at school, and Rosie got into his car at around 4.25. When Rosie left, she left the apartment door unlocked and Faith in her room, sleeping, and Jordan drove her to a mutual acquaintance's house where she would spend the night. Around 10.30 in the morning, Rosie tried to organise a lift back home and called Faith, but she didn't answer, leading Rosie to ask a friend named Marisol Wrangle to come and pick her up. They both went into the apartment together when they got back and called out to Faith, but all they were met with was an eerie silence and Faith didn't appear from her room. Wanting to check on her, Rosie and Marisol went into her room where they found Faith covered head to toe in a quilt. They called out to her again, but when she didn't respond, they lifted the cover and found Faith covered in blood and partially nude. They called 911, but at this point it was already too late and Faith had succumbed to her horrific injuries. The courts would keep her files sealed for a very long time, not officially announcing anything in her case until years after her death, when outrage from the community and the media would force their hands. They released documents on the evidence found at the scene and her autopsy report, which would only raise more questions than answers. 
Faith had died from several blunt force traumas to her face and head. Semen and other male DNA had been found at the scene, including on Faith and under her nails, though to this day, authorities have failed to mention if she was ever sexually assaulted. Together with the murder weapon, which was determined to be a rum bottle found at the scene, the police also showed the public a note that had been left there. It was written on the bottom of a white paper bag, apparently addressed to Faith as it was found near her body, and it read, quote, I'm not stupid, bitch, jealous. Due to the evidence found at the scene and the history between them, the police were quick to look at Eric Toki Jones, but comparing his DNA to the one that was both on Faith and the blood under her fingernails, they were able to rule him out as a suspect. This was both a good and a bad thing, as they now knew that it wasn't Eric who murdered her, but it opened up a pool of potential suspects to a wide range of people. The police collected thousands of samples of DNA, but they couldn't find a match for the one found at the scene, and the investigation stalled. They never closed the case, but with little to work with and the leads they did have coming up short, there was little progress in the case. Years later, a DNA profiler would put together an image based off DNA found at the scene in the hopes that it would generate some new clues. They determined that the DNA belonged to a male of either Native American or Latin descent. They determined that he more than likely had clear olive skin and black hair, but that was about all that they could say. His identity would remain a mystery until September of 2021, nine years after Faith's death, when a man was arrested and charged with her murder. Miguel Salguero Olivares was pulled over and charged with drunk driving, leading authorities to run his prints and his DNA through the system, and they came up with a surprising hit. His DNA matched the one found at the scene of Faith Hedgepeth's murder, and his prints matched the palm print left on the murder weapon. Authorities are still building a case against him and have asked the public for patience as they expect it will take some time before we have all the answers, but Miguel is currently awaiting trial and has been denied bond. He's since been charged with driving while impaired, having an open container of alcohol, having a fictitious vehicle tag and having no license or insurance, so it's unlikely that he'll see outside of a prison cell anytime soon. Police have yet to announce how Miguel knew Faith, or if he even knew her at all and was just taking advantage of Rosie leaving the door to the apartment open, and they say that they won't comment on it further as the case is still an open investigation. But Miguel's mother made a comment to WRAL News, saying that Miguel never even attended the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She went on to say that, quote, My son is not a murderer. I believe in my son. I believe it. He said he don't know the girl. Nevertheless, his arrest was a relief to Faith's family, who joined the Chapel Hill police in a press announcement after Miguel's arrest. Faith's father, Roland Hedgepeth, said, quote, I want to thank God for allowing me to see this day. Her mother added that she had faith that everything concerning Faith's death would be revealed over time. Together and speaking for the family, they said, quote, Our faith had a heart of gold and an infectious smile that illuminated a room. Although her time on earth was short, faith had an enormous impact on many. Our lives were forever changed when faith was taken from us on September 7th, 2012.